He's angry about mortgages. It's Angry Mortgage. He's swearing. He's cursing loud. He's old. He's opinionated. And he's been doing this so damn long. This program is about mortgages, and this is mortgage advice, but the advice may not apply to your situation. Contact licensed mortgage professionals for specific recommendations before you make decisions about mortgages. You may not agree with Ron, but if you don't, uh, he thinks you're wrong. Oh, and did we say there is a lot of swearing? And we are back. And it's not Jan. <laughs> Jan's not here today. Not Jan. <laughs> not Jan. Michelle's back. Michelle, Jan is off sick today. She's got bad laryngitis, so she's off sick. And Michelle, is fill, is, who's filled in for Jan before, is filling in. Thank you, Michelle. Thank okay. you for having me. My pleasure. Um, okay, so this was a really, to me, a really big announcement last Friday. Um. Kind of I, like a little, um, slightly emotional, okay? Because it's something I've been uh, going after for the better part of 10 years. So we finally, finally had an announcement from the government of Canada through Sean Fraser, the housing minister, that the federal government would move to stop mortgage document fraud in Canada. That the government would adopt a linkage to the CRA, uh, which I've been asking for for ever, and that would verify income in exactly the same way as they do in the United States for the IRS successfully, and that we would bring an end to people qualifying for mortgages with fake income documents which are advertised on Reddit for, T4s are advertised on Reddit for $19.99. You can okay. buy them yet. You can buy a fake <laughs> T4 on Reddit for $19.99. Along with the pay stubs. <laughs> and the pay stubs and all a long list of evil doings. And finally, and we've never had this before, we've never had a government ever before announce that they would take up the process of creating linkage between... CRA and the banks, credit unions, and verifying income. So it's a, it's a great thing on Friday. Uh, I was surprised and uh, a little bit, uh, like I say, I was uh, at the time, I was just a, a touch emotional because it's been a very, very long, long fight to right. destroy, bring an end to, it's not, it's not going to be like 110% solved but i think it will be better enormously better mm -hmm. enormously better because well I'll, I'll explain the details but that's the big deal of last week the beginning of the end it's not the end but it's the beginning of the end of fake income documents getting mortgages in canada so some of the details um this is really important to understand this is not an invasion of anyone's privacy because the truth is people give us these documents. You look at these documents all the time, all right? Day long, yep, all day long, yep. All day long, yeah. And the cu customer signs a release and all the borrowers sign a release and willingly give it to us mm -hmm. because it's necessary. It's part of the process. And they sign, we got them. We're looking at them, right? I'm looking at them all the time, yeah. So the really important part about why this is not a privacy infringement, first of all, they've given it to us. They have signed a release. They understand that lenders will look at it. So at this point in time, the only change we are making that we, to that process is that there will be a way, not for the mortgage broker. I want everybody to calm the fuck down about it being the mortgage broker. It's not the mortgage broker. The mortgage broker is not verifying your income with CRA. Big banks... Big financial institutions who are accredited through CMHC, credit unions, like the financial institutions that are already exchanging information. Because every time you, you do an investment or make a nickel of interest or sell a stock, 
You're already these, exchanging that information. They're yeah. reporting it, yeah. right? They're yeah, reporting it. So they have yeah. secure, like, oh, I don't know if it's going to be secure. Yes, fuck, yes, it's going to be secure mm-hmm. because they're exchanging this information with the CRA about your investments, about your income on those investments endlessly. Yeah. Endlessly. Right. Okay. So it is secure. That's number one. Number two, it's only one number. That's it. And your whole tax return, you're going to have a pages and pages and pages. By the way, someday we'll do a pod about how fucking ridiculous the amount of tax preparation you have to have in Canada, how much a massive amount of work it is, how complicated it is compared with other countries. Like apparently in Sweden, they do your taxes for you and just send it to you to look at. Okay. Yeah, like it's all electronic. So all that, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 why is it so fucking complicated in Canada that you drive all you drive forty percent of the population to pay somebody to do your taxes? I mean, mm-hmm. that that's a fuck up. But for another day, especially so, when it's already reported to the government, especially when the government's got all the documents <laughs> anyway. Yeah, exactly right. So, so yeah, um, it's one single number, line fifteen thousand on a uh, on your tax return, the return return you fill out give to the government it's just the verification that that one single number is correct not investigating all your business not seeing what child support you're getting not seeing how much money you're making i mean you gave it to that us that willingly right to get a mortgage you yeah. willingly give that information to yeah. you have to, to the lender you yeah. have to exactly and we're verifying one single number so there are there is zero privacy and uh, zero privacy issues here. None, zero. Everybody wants to talk about privacy. The classic Ron Butler phrase: "Shut the fuck up." Okay, <laughs> shut the fuck up. All right, no privacy issues. Security issues. It's the big banks talking to the CRA now. If you want to say, "Well, I don't think that's so secure," maybe you're right. Okay, <laughs> maybe you are right, but. I can't fix that. Nobody can fix that. Yeah. It's the big banks and it's the CRA. If that security is no good, I give up. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to comment on it. So, and for the people who think that, because I, I got a bunch of comments on this already, mm-hmm. on social media. I got a lot of social media comments. Some people thought, oh no, they'll find a way to cheat it. Well, I don't know how you find a way to cheat it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, It'll be I, very difficult now to cheat that. I just can't see it. I mean, it's it's very straightforward. And it eliminates all... Again, mortgage brokers are not involved. Mm-hmm. Okay, not involved. So, I mean, I'd say it's about time that they do something like this. How long have you been seeing this stuff over the years? About 25 years now. Oof, you know, same for me. Both on the real estate side and the mortgage side. Like, yeah. you, you see a lot of fraud. I mean, you see people... Selling homes that they don't even own. Well, not too many of those, thank God. (laughs) Thankfully, but but you do see it. (laughs) Uh, And um, but this thing is actually, you know, in some regions of Canada, it's common. Some some regions of Canada is not common. Like I don't, I don't think a shit ton of this is going on in the Northwest Territories. Okay, in the Yukon, there's probably very little mortgage fraud, very little mortgages too. We love you, Yukon. We do, but still. Um, But there's, it's regional. And we know that. And there's a lot of it in BC, a lot of it in Ontario, some in Alberta, some in Quebec. Um, it's everywhere. But it's all communities, too. I don't want to just point the finger at some communities. That's just that's just wrong. Shouldn't do it. Uh, I have seen mortgage fraud from every community, mm-hmm. every single one. But after I've been fighting for this fight for 10 years, this is the answer. It is highly secure. It is very simple. And it will... It will definitely, because this is something that's been, the IRS has had in the States for 15 years Long now. time, yeah. Long, long time. And it works down there. It works. We're not going to pretend there's no mortgage fraud on earth or in the States or here, or there won't be in the future. There's going to be some things happen. Yes. Fraudsters want to fraud. Mm-hmm. Thieves want to steal. That's okay, right. yeah. That's the way life works. Okay. They'll try to find other ways, but it will be so much harder to yeah. do. Okay. This will help mitigate that at least. It's a great day. It's a great day. And how has it helped Canadians in general? It's like this. First of all, we should have a fundamentally fair system of getting a mortgage. Mm -hmm. You know, if people are finding it hard to get the house they want, to get the mortgage they want based on their incomes, it shouldn't 
there shouldn't be any shortcut for crooks. Yeah, okay? I agree. That is total fucking bullshit. Okay, should not happen. Uh, it also is impactful on the price of homes because if you just can qualify for a home, you don't. Like, I, I picked the one for a million seven, and you're going to make up the documents to make it work for me. Okay. Right, yeah. Well, I guess you're not too worried about the price because it's ma- the the you can come the up with whatever magical. docs you want. Oh, the, my final comment on this is to sometimes ex- to explain to people who would say, "Well, whoa, 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 wait a minute! Like, why would somebody buy a house and fake the income if they can't afford to make the payments?" Okay, which is the right question. Thank you. Um, it's an easy answer. There's sources of income that people don't want to reveal. Uh, which is the most dangerous side of this business, of fake income. There's also people who just want a better rate. In other words, they could qualify through an alternative lender, which you know. Yep. You, you do those a- You do those, those mortgages every day, yeah, okay? Right. And it's a little bit more expensive, mm-hmm. right? That's the essence of yeah, it. Yeah. It's a little bit more expensive, but you don't have to be as fussy on income, mm-hmm. okay? So it's to avoid... In most cases, I'd say 80% of the time, it's to avoid paying the alternative lender rates and get the very best bank rate. Yeah. Fair, right? Yeah. Okay. They want to avoid paying lender fees too, right? Because All fees, right. Yeah. They, yeah. they want a perfectly normal bank mortgage, which is the lowest cost and the best deal. Yep. Okay. And to do that, they commit fraud, income document fraud. Because let's face it, in some of these situations, people have cash income, they're not revealing to CRA. People have uh, have taken just radical amounts of deduction from their own corporations to the point where, you know, they got their corporation paying for everything and they're hardly taking any money out just to cover the mortgage, but they still are comfortable. We've got situations where there's multiple people working multiple gig jobs. You know, there's seven people in a family all working, but a lot of the jobs are part-time, part-time gig work. Yeah. Some of them are cash. They can easily make the payments, but the mortgage underwriting is hard. And they want the best rate. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's most of it. Um, but why we have to end it, why it's so necessary to end it, is we have to have fairness. Everybody needs, and can't, that, that's the one thing that burns my ass in Canada is we're easy on white collar crime in this country. Mm-hmm. And that ain't fair to everybody who's doing the right thing every day. Yeah, Simple as right. that. So final, po- final comments on this. It's not going to happen overnight. They got to start. I, I I absolutely know. I've had discussions with people all over the place. The CRA has already studied this. By the way, this is not going to be fucking arrive scam. This is not going to be fucking arrive can seventy million dollar bullshit application. Barely works. Everybody's getting paid off. No, this is an internal CRA workout. It is it is just piggybacking off the linkage they have with banks already because CRA is getting information from banks every day. All the time, yeah. Every hour. They're getting information about people's return on their investments, they're selling stocks, they're getting interest payments. Um, and once a year, there's a deluge of it comes in with T4s. I mean, it's a long, but it's constant communication. Mm-hmm. The lines between CRA and the banks and the credit unions are easy to, to manage. And it's just a question of a simple system. Remember, we're only checking one number, just mm-hmm. one. That's it. Not yeah. studying anybody's tax return, not doing any of those things. One number. And that's the fix. So let me say this. Uh, Sean Fraser, I'll thank you again. Housing minister. Like everybody's going to say, stop it. Don't thank the liberal government. We hate them. <laughs> uh, look, first of all, we got to learn to be polite about our political discourse. We mm. should... Uh, I ran something on the finance minister uh, the other day uh, on social media, and people said some things that would uh, shock you, okay, about the finance minister. Um, we, we've got to stop being angry at these. You can be mad. You're entitled to be mad. You don't like the policies. I think most of the policies are crap, okay? I, I don't like the way it's being run either. But I don't think the human beings are evil. Sometimes we often forget that, you know, politicians are still people. Absolutely. And I don't think because they've made tons of mistakes on policy, because they have a certain set of beliefs, I don't think it makes any sense to say they're stupid. I don't mm. think it makes any sense to say they're crooks. Well, if, if it 
prove if, if it proves one of them's a crook, let's let's find out. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, but to just say it over and over and over, uh, to talk about people's families is wrong. To talk about people's people's <laughs> personal lives is wrong, especially when it's just a lie. Okay, so I'll I'll make that clear. Uh, but when something happens, that's good. Uh, that's meaningful and that helps our society, like the end of mortgage fraud, mortgage document fraud, um, the end of fake income documents. Sean Fraser, thank you. It's a good move. Now, let's hurry the fuck up. Okay. <laughs> and I don't want to have to be coming back in two months and saying, yeah, nothing's happened. What's going on? Like, I want to hear about progress. Uh, and if we don't hear about progress, I am going to be back on the social media. I'm going to be back on this podcast, and I am not going to thank John Fraser. I am going to raise hell. Okay, <laughs> so you're you're on the clock. Thank you very much, John Fraser. You're also on the fucking clock. We got to get going on this. Let's make it happen. You've announced it. Let's make it happen. This isn't that hard to do. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, I agree. There was another announcement uh, on the housing front. We got a lot of questions on this, so I want to review it with everybody. Uh, the finance minister, Krista Freeland, announced that there would be um, 30 year amortization for CMHC insured mortgages. By the way, whenever I say CMHC, I really mean all of them. Mm-hmm. Like there's three insurers, the there's three insurers, there's CMHC, there's Sajin, there's Canada Guarantee, all good people. I know the folks at all those companies, great people, uh, doing great work. And uh, they all do the same kind of great job. Now, but sometimes it's easier just to say CMHC. So these are low down payment mortgages that are default insured. And she they have only been 25-year amortization on all of them. Right. Well, maybe not always. Was it in the past? Was Isn't it in the past, like it was like 40-year amortization? Yeah, if I stuff? go back a long ways, right? If I go back about 18 years or something or... 14 years, there was, there was a moment in time when, for, okay, just to give the quick history, folks, in Canada, it was 25 years forever, like since like First World War days, like it was just, mm-hmm. that was all it was, 25 year amortization, you had to pay the mortgage off in 25 years, and then it uh, started about 15 years ago, it started spinning around, there was like 30 years, that was a new thing, there was like 35 years then, 40 yeah. years, I mean, whoa, and then all of a sudden, as we got closer to 2008, uh, particularly around 2008, that all stopped. Yeah. <laughs> World financial crisis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that stopped. And all of a sudden, it went back to 30 years for conventional mortgages. And for these mortgages, which are um, seamlessly insured, so people are paying a default insurance premium. Yep. And it could be a lot of money. It's like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for $40,000 for some people. Um, it's 25 years. Okay, and that was the limit. It's been the limit for many years now for just those mortgages. But for conventional, if you put 20% down, you could get 20, you get 30-year amortization. What are your thoughts on 30-year amortization, though? Like, do you really think that, you know, increasing your amortization and paying more interest is in the benefit of the client? It's a great question. That really is a great question because we hear that from every time this comes up, subject comes up, we hear that. And it's meaningful. So what Michelle is referring to is that the longer you stretch your mortgage out, if you stretch your mortgage out five years, oh, you say, oh, that five years is not that much. But it because of the interest rates we have today, when they're in the fives and sixes, and even when they go back into the fours, you're you're paying a lot of interest. Like when we used to look at like 2.49 interest rates, which we had for years, right? Yep, a long time. Uh, for 10 years. Well, you would always see that every time you made a payment, you paid off a lot. Like you made the first payment, you were paying off 70% of the, it was principal. Mm-hmm. You're paying your loan down by 70%. Now, now because of these interest. higher rates, when you make up your first payment, you're only paying down like 10%, 15%, mm-hmm. 25%. You know, like it's a far reduced number depending on the rate you have. You're paying mostly interest. So that when we expand your mortgage out from 25 years to pay it off to 30 years, that greatly expands the interest you're paying. That's, That's right. all true. Okay. And it's a fact. People should try to make lump sum payments and pay their mortgage off as fast as they can. But here's the kicker. The house prices almost everywhere in Canada have doubled in 12 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, the, and I, I, I've talked a lot about that, a yeah. lot. I've talked a lot of time about batshit crazy house prices in Canada. I've spent a lot of time on it. Uh, but it's a fact. So 
if you don't have 30 years, you can't buy it. Can't qualify. Can't yeah. qualify. So it's all, like a catch twenty two. It's either you're paying more interest or you don't get a house. You don't get a house. You don't get a house. You know? So uh, because just just the other week we had a story of young Canadians who seventy six percent of them thought like I don't know if I'm going to ever ever have a chance to buy a house. Mm-hmm. That's a bad thing. Yeah. That's thoroughly bad. So yes, you're right. It's more interest, and you just don't have a choice. The price mm-hmm. of houses is too high in Canada. So I want to nail down this particular move on um, the offering of changing from 25-year amortization to 30-year amortization for low down payment CMHC mortgages. It's very restrictive, Mm -hmm. very restrictive. Important to know this. It's only for first-time home buyers, first-time home buyers. By the way, some people think that these mortgages are all should be only for first-time home buyers, but in reality, you could do it over and over and over. As long as you live in the house, you could buy a condo with 10% down. And then you could buy a townhouse with 10% down. And then a few years later, you could buy a semi with 10% down. And then a few years after that, you could buy a detached, if you can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck affording it. So from- <laughs> you can afford it with 10% down. As long as, but it has to be less than a million dollars. That's the key. It right. has to be less than a million dollars. That's the big rule, less than a million. So if you've already bought your condo and you want to... You sell it and you're going to move into the townhouse and you want to see if you can get 30 year amortization. You can't. You're not a first time homebuyer anymore. Right. Okay. Not just that, but you can't buy any house. You can only buy a new construction home, new construction home, strata condo, whatever the case may be, a new construction dwelling. So it has to be brand new. So this doesn't apply to any resale at all. Wow. So the truth is, it's a very small amount of people who mm-hmm. are going to be able to take advantage of this. A very yeah. small group who's going to be able to get it. So it's an announcement. Sounded good. Doesn't really apply to anybody, you know. So heart, like, I did an estimate. I did a quick, quick estimate on a calculator. Like, I know. I don't even use a spreadsheet. I don't even use Excel. I'm like a fucking dinosaur, right? <laughs> I don't even use Excel. I had a quick calculator thing on paper. I had a pen in my hand, Okay. What's a pen? Some people are asking. What is that? What is he talking about? What's paper? So anyway, the only paper, the only paper young people know now are either toilet paper, Kleenex, or paper towels. They don't know there's yeah. actually paper you write on. Uh, so yeah, I did a quick calculation. I think it really only applies to about three percent of purchases. Wow, that's all. That's all it is. So if people want to yap and moan and carry on about it, you can, but it's really not that impactful. I mean, hopefully everything helps. I hope we help young people to buy new homes. But um, yeah, it's, it's not very impactful at all. It just doesn't fit. Uh, she had, oh, the, the finance minister, lots going on with the finance minister this week. Just lots going on. Uh, she had another big announcement. She said that for people who have uh, difficulty paying their mortgage, you know, particularly with the renewal rates we have in Canada, if you have difficulty paying your mortgage, she would allow 35-year amortization to try to help you. Didn't they already have things in place for that? Well, to help. quite link, right. You know. Quite right. But what, what, those were temporary. Okay, She's talking about making them, that, in other words, that you could temporarily go to 35 years just to get through the, over the financial hardship, and then eventually you'd return to your normal amortization. She actually announced that she wants to in, enact rules where you could do that forever. Like for, like for the term of your mortgage, you could be 35 years. But before everybody loses their mind, listen, listen. One very important word here. Only insured mortgages. Only back to these high ratio CMHC small down payment mortgages. If you if that's not your mortgage, you can't do it. Like you could ask the bank to go back to 30 years, but you you know, getting 35 years out of a bank on a on a conventional mortgage that wasn't high ratio insured was damn hard and you it was only temporary. Okay. But typically the banks will work with a client, correct? If the, if they find they're getting in trouble with their mortgage or they're not able to make payments, would they not kind of step in and help a client in that capacity? They would. Uh, but in this particular case, it's ultra specific. It's just for insured mortgages. So for insured mortgages, if you get in trouble, you call your bank, you say, I don't think I can make these payments. You know, they've gone up, my renewal's up, or I'm variable, it went up. I don't think I can make these payments where I have a financial difficulty, my spouse lost their job, whatever the case may be. Uh, the bank for insured mortgages, again, CMHC, Sajin, and Canada Guarantee, the bank can go to those companies and say, hey, 
do you want to help these people? Because it's your insurance claim. If they don't mm. pay, that's your insurance claim. So do you want to help them? And yes, there's programs galore to help. Absolutely. And they've been around forever. And you're quite right. The bank wants to help. However, the Bank Act and all of the you know worldwide treaties we've agreed to with and worldwide policy we've adhered to with other banks, other financial organizations on earth, have said that we're not going to let people default on their mortgage forever. Like we got to, we got to recover the capital. We got to be, we, we got to deal with that problem. So we have a lot of laws that we can't break on that. You know, if people can't pay their mortgage, there's got to be action taken. Yes, you can do temporary measures to try to help people. But yeah. what the finance minister is discussing is like, a hey, we're going to permanently switch you to 35 years amortization. Only the insurers can approve that. Hmm. Only the insurers, because it's actually in, in a way it goes into a special section of the bank's portfolio, a special section of their balance sheet, which says this is a government secured loan and the government is enforcing a new payment strategy. Okay. okay. Another key thing to remember about this, everybody lost their minds. They saw this uh, on social media. They saw 35 years, everybody lost their minds. Oh, the end of the world. It's the end of the world. Yeah, we're going to be uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, yes, it's meaningful, but it's not what you think. You have to prove the financial hardship right you have to prove it yeah. okay you have to prove it and it 35 years amortization is the limit and you can't if it if you just say well give me 35 years and i'll see if i can do my best mm -hmm. but i'm not sure i can even pay that so what type of proof are they going to be looking for full now? financial disclosure oh, okay full financial disclosure pay stubs documents bank statements you got to do full financial disclosure that you literally are in financial hardship yeah. and that something has radically changed. You can show a job loss letter, you know, lost your job or something happened in your life. You became disabled, something, something. You have to provide all documentary proof of the financial hardship. Now, would it be better for a client to defer a mortgage payment or two versus increasing their amortization to 35 years? Good question. That is something a bank can make their own decision on. Lots of banks have skip a payment programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so do credit unions. Many credit unions do. Uh, but it, that better be really temporary. In other words, you lost a job and I have you know, I know my work. I have no problem finding another job. I'm just going to find another job. I just got a couple of months blip. Mm -hmm. What the finance minister is talking about for 35-year amortization is like a permanent, un hardly manageable difficulty, which in some cases is going to be a renewal that came in, you used to be paying, yeah, right. You right. were paying yeah. 319 and now you're paying 529 and you can't do it. Yeah. Again, only for insured mortgages, mm -hmm. only. Um, and you have to prove it. You have to produce all the documents. So it's certainly not a huge group of people. And it, it's nobody who's got a conventional mortgage is going to get away with this. Like it just, if you, if you don't have the CMHC mortgage, if you don't, if you weren't low down payment purchase, not happening. You've got banks going to make their own decision. And you have to make, you know, you have to be able to make the 35 year payments. If you say, well, I, I don't even think I can make these payments at 35 years, I'll try. Mm -hmm. Then the insurer, again, CMHC or one of the others, has to say, well, no, we can't do that. Right. No, unless you can prove to us that you can either, it's a job loss, or you can somehow increase your income or something. You can't do that. You just can't pick your payment. Okay. So that would result in people having to sell the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I did want to touch on those two things because they were they were people blew up about it. They were excited. People, the public said, "That's unfair. I'm making my payments. Why can't I have 35 year?" Mm -hmm. Well, that's why. <laughs> that's why it's it's hard to get. Yeah, it's hard to get if you're not insured. You reduce your payments. They're going to kick you out of your house and sell it. Power sale, foreclosure. So yeah, don't get any ideas. Okay, right. this is for a very again. It's a. It's sort of a campaign style, right? It's sort mm -hmm. of politics. It's like political theater. Hey, this is a big announcement. I'm helping all these people. But it's not really that many people. I mean, so then does it make sense for people to kind of not put 20% down payment? You know, go for the insured deals versus uninsured in the event that, you know, things happen in people's lives, right? So, you know, you close on a mortgage, for example, and then you lose your job. Now what? Yeah. Um, well, again, if you... Even if it's insured, if you if you don't have any hope of ever making the thirty five year payment, they're going to tell you to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a good question. So should people choose to maybe make if they could make twenty percent, make less, so you gain some advantage on rate and you gain some advantage on um, on, on program. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. Getting those small down payment mortgages is hard as fuck. Yeah, okay? it's way more difficult. Like, it's way sure. more difficult. They're way, they're super tough on income. They're mm-hmm. super tough on debt ratios. You can't, there's not even one millimeter of wiggle room in the debt ratios. It is like, they are just careful as can be. Yeah. Okay, so you might not be getting any house. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the other consideration. And let's face it. If you if you've got a good good idea that you're going to make the payments and your life's going to be okay, I don't think you want to pay thirty five thousand dollars in insurance premium, right? That's true. <laughs> that's a lot of that's a lot of fucking lot money. Of money. Yeah. <laughs> so good question, but that I think that's the logical answer. Mm-hmm. Just doesn't make sense for people to pay the huge premium. So that's that's the way it, most people look at it. Okay, we got uh, viewer mail. We got the questions. We do. Let's have some okay. questions from the folks out there. Okay, so the first question is i see ron on the news like ctv and cp24 and he always has a shirt and tie on does he ever take those off i do take them off for the shower uh i I take them (laughs) off for sleeping um (laughs) this look i i a long time ago when we started the podcast i talked about the shirt and tie and, and you know looking look trying to look professional uh, I realize, like, I don't think I look anything special. I mean, when you're 67 years old and you weigh 325 pounds, you, uh, the only thing you're doing is polishing a turd if you think you're going to look better. Okay. <laughs> That's the truth. But, uh, the reason I do it is really simple. I want to show respect for the audience. Uh, I want to show that, you know, that I, you know, when anybody tells me, oh, Ron, you know, get with it. You should be wearing a T-shirt that says only here for the beer uh, or, you know, uh, hey, Maui or, you know, big thing, of, you know, like that big uh, cannabis uh, weed thing, you know, you can wear. You should be, yeah, try to look cool, Ron. You're really cool. Well, first of all, I'm just not, generally not cool. OK. And the other consideration is, is that. I still believe I'm old fashioned and I believe that people. um I don't know how serious I can take somebody in a Joker t-shirt. Okay. Like I, I just, you know, like this if, is true. If I'm going to, if I'm going to, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. You don't have to look like me. You don't have to dress up like a shirt and a tie all the time, but, um, I'm just used to it cause I'm old. Uh, I don't know. I feel like there's a different vibe when you get up in the morning and you actually get dressed nicely to go for work. It, set you up for the day yeah like fuck yeah thank you you know yes like okay. i was always taught to dress for success well even if even if we're not that successful at <laughs> least dress like you're going to work Look okay the part. <laughs> like i sometimes question like sometimes I, i've been sometimes when i'm downtown toronto i'm looking around and say everybody in the sidewalk they look like they're in their pajamas and i think they're going to work okay like it's pretty low-key holy shit uh but yeah that's just the way i feel i feel i want to show respect for the audience that i take it seriously and uh that's why like 99.9% of the time, you see me in a, in a shirt and tie. That's yeah. it. I mean, even when you come to work, when you're not podcasting. It, 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 you know. it just, I just put the tie on every morning. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. I keep hearing my friends talking about penalties on mortgage, mortgages and the variable has the lowest penalty, but I'm scared of the variable. What do I do? Well, if I think I'm, I'm interpreting that is what we get from a lot of people is that, hey, I think I want to take variable, even though it's a higher rate because it is, it's like 6.25, 6.45, 6.5 versus a three-year fixed at say, you know, 499 or a five-year fixed at 489 or, a, um, you know, you know, why I want to take a variable because I think there'll be a big penalty if I take, um, because variable is only three months interest. And fixed mortgages have a process called interest rate differential, which is a complicated, really, you know, sometimes people try to sum it up, but the truth is every bank is different. Mm -hmm. Every lender is different. So I'm not going to summarize it. I'm just going to say it's a fairly complicated calculation that guarantees it's going to be a shit ton more than six months or five months or four months. So if you're, if you're of interest, so if you're guaranteed three months interest penalty with variable, People like the certainty of it. Mm-hmm. So that's some reasons that people would select variable. But I always say the same thing. Like, why are you so worried about penalty if you're not planning on moving? Mm-hmm. You know, when I look at people who are moving into a house that they call, oh, this is my dream home, this is my forever home. Or I look at young people who are putting uh, like 5 or 10% down on a condo. I say, yeah, but I say, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to leave for five years or three years or something. Like, I don't, you know, unless something radical happens in your life, I don't think... I don't think that many people actually move every two years, okay? So really, when you're deciding between fixed and variable, it's more or less your long-term goals of the property. And just your 
general life expectations too. Mm-hmm. Okay, like uh, like nobody should be focused on a penalty if they don't have a legitimate belief that they're going to need to break the mortgage. Mm-hmm. So if you don't need to break the mortgage, let's say you took a three year, and then towards the end of the three year you were thinking, well, maybe we should move in the next two years. Okay, take a variable then, take or care. take a one year, or take a two year. Okay, because the one thing about taking a two year, if you're getting towards the very end of the two years, the penalty's small. The penalty might only be three months. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I, here's what I don't believe: I don't believe that that you should be told by mortgage professionals you need to take a variable because I think you're going to probably break your mortgage once every two or three years. Okay, because that is total bullshit. Mm-hmm. That is not the way it works. Okay. All right, so I think I addressed that question. It's about being thoughtful about how long you're in the house because it doesn't make any sense to pay extra for variable if you're just worried about a penalty that never happens. Yeah, okay? true. That, that doesn't make sense. Okay, what's the rate action this week? The mortgage rate action this week is on fixed rates up. There was a um, big inflation print in the United States. Inflation is still running hot. Inflation is coming down in Canada, but going, running hot in the United States still. Not crazy hot, like 8%, but 3 point something, and not going down anymore. Uh, so immediately, uh, U.S. Treasuries sold off. There's other reasons. They just actually, I, I won't bore everybody with the whole capital market scenario, but in the United States, they have to sell uh, their equivalent of bonds, which they refer to as treasuries. Uh, their equivalent of government bonds have to have an auction every week. Right. And if the auction goes like shit, yields go up. (laughs) (laughs) So um, so, uh, that's what happened in the States. Big jump in yields on the 10-year bond. Yields went way up. And that sort of pushes Canada along for sure. And it also, one of the reasons it pushes Canada, we are an independent country after all, but it pushes Canada because... People, the, the bond traders think, well, is that going to be Canada too? Like, is if it's running that hot in the States, here's what we know. The Bank of Canada can cut rates before the U.S. does. That's the truth. They can. Okay. But they don't like to. Mm-hmm. We usually follow suit, right? Try to follow suit. It tries to, it tries to be yeah. synchronized. Mm-hmm. But they can, and they will. They will. Okay. But... It makes people stop, it makes the bond traders who control fixed mortgage rates, folks, as we've said this a thousand times, bond, Canadian bond yields, Canadian government bond yields control mortgage rates in Canada, fixed rates, two year, three year, five year. Um, it makes the traders stop and think, oh shit, maybe the cuts are farther away. Mm-hmm. And they have been, the cuts keep getting pushed out. But that drove fixed rates up. Some fixed rates went up 10 beeps. So again, uh, that's like less than a, some beeps, some went up 20. Mm-hmm. I mean, what I would say today is there's only a handful. There used to be a lot of rates, three-year and five-year fixed rates. There used to be a bunch of them below four. Sorry, below five. There used to be like four something, four six four, four six nine, four seven nine, four nine nine. There used to be a bunch of them, both conventional and high ratio insured. Be a lot of rates slightly. We have access. We had access to lots of rates below, uh, both on three-year and five-year and four-year. On uh, Less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Hell of a lot fewer now. Like that's gone up. So it's mostly low fives. But again, I'll give you my final, final, final on this. Sooner or later, rates come down. Not not this month, not in May. Eventually. (laughs) Eventually. Sooner or later, whether it's July or it's September, sooner or later, the Bank of Canada cuts. Now I know there'll be, because there always is, this podcast, there'll be 75 different comments that say, fuck you, you're stupid, it's going to go up, the rate's going to go up, Bank of Canada's never going to cut, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I mean, they keep increasing uh, rates and people are going bankrupt. Yeah, so. <laughs> like, I mean, folks, I mean, uh, I'm going on a limb here, but not very far, but I think we're going to see Canadian, continuous information about problems in the Canadian economy. And sooner or later, there's a cut. That's just the way life goes. Mm -hmm. There'll be a cut someday. Simple as that. Um, It's not today, not next month, maybe not June. Sooner or later, the Bank of Canada cuts, and it'll cut for a while. And fixed rates will fall, and variable rates will fall, and there'll be lower rates. It ain't going to be 199 again. No. Okay, I mean, not 199. Okay. Have you ever really seen rates that cheap? Like 
I, I don't recall rates ever no, being that no, there, cheap. There's never, there was never in the history of Canada, the rates we had in 2021, um, they haven't existed. We had variable rates, at, high ratio variable rates at 0. 0.89. Mm. Now, they went right back up, so that everybody got humped on that. But we did a lot of five-year fixed, 149, 159, mm -hmm. And there was about three weeks when you could have got a 10-year for 199 Oh, my gosh. Nobody wanted it. Nobody they just want wanted the 149 Yeah. You know, Nobody wants to nine. lock in for 10 years. Nobody right? wants to lock in for 10 years. So that's it. Every time, everybody, every, every time we get a social media comment that says, we need 30-year mortgages like they have in the state, same rate for 30 years. Okay, buddy. Best wishes. Mm -hmm. Because nobody takes the 10-year. No. <laughs> How often have you ever seen a 10-year? I don't think I ever have. No, I've seen a few, but damn few. We, it's just, as soon as you say, all right, because the 10-year is always about half a percent higher than the five-year. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, no, 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 I'll, I'll just take the five. I don't like to pay extra. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, that's that's just the way Canada works. That's just the way we work here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, there's been another bump in rates on fixed rates, uh, but I promised there would be bumps. It's not linear. There's going to be bumps. And then eventually, eventually, by the end of this year, there's cuts and rates come down. Not not to 199, not to 299, but in the fours. Yeah. Uh, not in the fives anymore, in the fours. We'll see it eventually. So just, if you got your renewal coming up next week, all I can say is, sorry. <laughs> 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 or next month, or May. I mean, it could be worse. It could be like me and have to renew in November. <laughs> no, November. Oh, last, last November. Last November. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was that was a that was fuckery. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely was. That was fuckery. Wow. Jesus. <laughs> that was bad timing. Sorry, Michelle. That was bad. That was bad. All right. Well, that brings us to our favorite part of the program. What the actual fuck, Ron? What the actual fuck <laughs> is going on? Like I've been talking about her this podcast. I got to talk about her again. Krista Freeland. Krista Freeland, and I, again, I'm going to make people mad. I'm going to say this out loud. Krista Freeland is an intelligent, hardworking woman, okay, who has a shit ton of wrong policies. And most important, too many jobs, yeah. okay? Like, yeah. seriously. She like, wears a lot of hats. Too many jobs, mm -hmm. right? You're the finance minister, which is a hugely important job. It's second only to the prime minister's importance, mm -hmm. okay? And never more important than when the economy is a fuck show like it's going on right now, okay? Mm -hmm. And when there's a, like a crisis on some interest rate issue every week where there's all kinds of things happening every week in finance, lots to worry about. Got to have a full-time person in there. Can't be the deputy prime minister too. Mm -hmm. Can't be the sort of the assistant minister in charge of Ukraine, okay? I get it. She's Ukrainian. She's got uh, her heart's in the right place, but... Sweet Jesus. I mean, like... How do you juggle all of that? And, you know, again, I am not personally attacking the finance minister. But these are mistakes. Okay, these are mistakes. So, and it's not just her. her the, whole, the whole liberal cabinet seems to spend a fantastic amount of time away from the office. Mm -hmm. Okay, like... I know I'm I'm old fat. Everybody says, "Oh, Ron, you're so fucking stupid." Everybody's working from home. You're old fucking grumpy fuck. Everybody's working from home now. Everybody just climbs on Zoom. It's just Zoom. I mean, nobody needs to be in their office because I'm told from fairly reliable sources that on average, um, Krista Friedland is in Ottawa in her office maybe six or seven days a month. Wow. Oh, sure. She's a politician who needs to get out and into see canadians but i'm a firm fucking believer i don't give a shit what anybody says i'm a firm believer that for very important jobs for very big jobs there needs to be face-to-face -face meetings there needs to be a room full of people who are your reporting who report to you and there's got to be a meeting and there's got to be discussions of what's going right and what's going wrong and there needs to be like real policy ground out. You can't grind out policy when you're just doing announcements all the time on a podium yeah, all the time. That's right. Uh, you need you need to pay attention. There's a lot of stuff to absorb. There's a lot of stuff to comment on. There's a lot of stuff to make phone calls about. Like I remember days when the prime minister, like he 
it's like I, I think the the, the prime minister just passed away, Brian Mulroney. He was famous. Like he'd be he'd be, make like 150 phone calls a day. Wow. Like he'd be phoning people in his departments. He'd be phoning people that he knew about asking them questions. He'd be phoning. He'd be in, and you can't do that when you're attending a announcement in a factory. You got to get there like an hour ahead of time. You got to travel. travel. You, yeah. Yeah. Like, like look. <sighs> like. It's a serious fucking job, the finance minister. I, this is not my first time I've ranted about this, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm getting madder and fucking madder about this, okay? It's a serious fucking job. We need serious attention to it. There's lots going on. There's lots of follow through needed. Lots of accountability. Lots of accountability. <laughs> Shit ton of accountability. So let's do this. Trudeau, cabinet, Christopher Freeland in particular, get rid of one of the jobs. If you're going to be the finance minister, get rid of all the other jobs. Be the finance minister. Quit campaigning. Yeah. Okay. Like there's not going to be an election for like another year or mm -hmm. more. Okay. Like quit the fucking everywhere. Sure. You want to go and talk to people in can across Canada to do that. Do that maybe like a week a month and then spend the rest of the fucking time in Ottawa at your fucking desk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I'm not angry at you as a person, but I'm getting pretty fucking angry about lack of attention. Yeah. Okay. I think everybody in Canada, I don't think there's too many people who would argue that point. We need a first full time finance minister. Let's get one. Thank you for joining us this week, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you. If you like the pod, well, don't just sit there. Go to YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and all the other ones and like the pod. And don't forget to subscribe so we can keep being angry at mortgages and swearing about mortgages. Angry Mortgage could use your support.